Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. Sometimes doing the right thing goes against common sense. It might involve personal sacrifice or missing out on an opportunity to earn a living. It might even put us in danger. The right thing is rarely the safest path forward, but it often represents the best odds. In September of 1914, the people of France found themselves in a desperate position. The soldiers and war machines of Germany were marching closer and closer to Paris. It wasn't as if they hadn't tried to stop them, though. That's what they've been doing for weeks. The war had sprung like a leak from a seemingly tiny hole with the assassination of Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand. That was June 28th of 1914. By August 1st, Germany had declared war on Russia. Two days later, they set their sights on France as well. They had lost territory to France in the aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War of 1871, and they wanted it back. In late August, on their way to France's northern border, Germany pushed through Belgium. The small nation was quickly captured, and by August 20th, it was in full occupation. All of a sudden, the enemy had possession of territory right on the border, and they showed no signs of stopping. Germany's forces were like a tidal wave of bullets and blood, and it seemed very likely that France would indeed be invaded. But again, they tried to stop it. British soldiers came to help, but the Battle of Mons did not go as well as they had hoped for, sending France and her allies into a quick retreat. That was August 23rd. You have to stop and think about what it must have felt like for the people of France, and specifically those in the capital city of Paris. A foreign power had declared war on them and was now barreling toward them like a juggernaut. In fact, nothing had stopped Germany at all and it would have been easy to feel hopeless in the face of that approaching danger. In fact, Britain's foreign secretary at the time, Sir Edward Grey, expressed that hopelessness out loud to a friend when he said, The lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. So that's where the people of France were at, politically and emotionally, at the beginning of September of 1914. Germany had broken through, and despite their best efforts, was quickly marching toward Paris. So French forces were gathering along the Marne River, northeast of Paris, to try and stop them. There was only one problem with the plan. They were vastly outnumbered, and while there were thousands of additional soldiers inside Paris itself, the front line was 40 miles away, and they had no way to get them there. If ever there was a time when the difference between the right choice and the wrong choice could be measured in lives, this was it. And that's when one of the generals had an idea. What if all the taxis in Paris closed up for the day and instead agreed to drive the soldiers to battle? It would mean asking these drivers to put their lives in danger. It would mean asking them to give up the money they might have earned that day. But then again, if Germany broke through, how many customers would have been left for them anyway? So they all made the difficult decision. They were going to help. On September 7th, a fleet of over 600 taxis lined up in Paris, took on heavy loads of soldiers and gear, and then set off for the Marne. When they arrived that night, the sight of thousands of fresh troops sent a jolt of electricity through the French forces, giving them a new drive to succeed. And succeed, they did. Oh, and the taxis? Most of them headed home the moment they dropped off their precious cargo. I can't blame them. Those cars were their livelihood and they probably wanted to get away from the battle as fast as they could. Many, though, stuck around and were used to transport wounded soldiers to safety. Because, well, it was the right thing to do. Tragedy usually takes things from us. Our possessions, our homes, and sometimes even the lives of the people in our community. But if the story of the taxi drivers of Paris has anything to teach us, it's just how powerful the illogical can be. By putting their own lives at risk and jeopardizing their livelihood, they helped turn the tide in a war that seemed all but lost. It might not make sense, but then again, 
That's what makes people curious. Eccentric people are nothing if not entertaining. Their behaviors can either be charmingly strange or borderline appalling, like those of Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. He had a habit of judging people, not by their clothing or upbringing. To get a good sense of a person's character, he would, um, sniff their excrement. Author Charles Dickens, on the other hand, insisted on always sleeping while facing north. He believed that it helped his creativity. Dickens even carried a compass with him to ensure that whenever he wrote, he was doing so while pointing northward. And Waldo Pierce was another eccentric. He was a painter, born in Maine in 1884 to a lumber baron father. His upbringing was nothing out of the ordinary. He grew up alongside two brothers and a sister, attended Harvard, and even played on the university's football team. After he graduated, though, the budding artist decided he wanted to see the world especially the areas where his field was experiencing an explosion of creativity. With a focus on Impressionism, Pierce left the U.S. bound for England and Paris, along with his friend, John Reed. They had boarded a cattle ship called the SS Bostonian, which was set to reach Liverpool in just 10 days. Reed made the trip. Pierce, on the other hand, had second thoughts about his accommodations— Having come from wealth, he couldn't bear to be stuck on a ship that reeked of cow manure and eat food that was crawling with worms. He had just settled into his cabin when the notion struck him to get off the ship as quickly as possible. As it was pulling out of Boston Harbor, he leapt from the deck into the water and swam back to shore. It was such a last-minute decision that he left his wallet and watch behind. His friend, John Reed, was questioned about his friend's disappearance. He handed over Pierce's belongings, which had been left right there on his bed. The captain, however, didn't buy his story about Pierce jumping ship. Reed was taken into custody and thrown into the brig for his friend's murder. Once the Bostonian reached England, Reed was actually led in chains by two British officers to the Board of Trade, where he was to be tried for Pierce's demise. Lucky for him, his buddy wasn't far behind. Pierce had bought himself a ticket on the luxury liner the Mauritania, which had gotten to Liverpool a few days early. The captain accused him of breaking his contract by abandoning his post on the Bostonian. Pierce, ever the practical joker, had the perfect alibi. He told the court that he'd gotten seasick and fallen overboard. He had even tried to call for help, but the captain had been on the bridge and probably couldn't hear him. Much to Pierce's surprise and luck, the captain really had been on the bridge— so the matter was dropped. That wouldn't be the last time the artist had fun at someone's expense, though. As Pierce's popularity grew in the art world, he started making some interesting new friends. For example, he traveled extensively throughout Europe with Ernest Hemingway after World War I. He also married Broadway actress Ivy Troutman in 1920, after which the couple moved to Paris, where Troutman befriended author James Joyce. And it was during this time when Pierce carried out perhaps the most elaborate prank of his life. As he got to know the concierge of his building, he learned that the woman had a fondness for animals. So, one day, he gifted her with a turtle. Yeah, a a turtle. It wasn't the biggest of turtles, mind you, but it became a real source of joy for her. She came to love the animal as anyone might love a dog or a cat. And soon enough, the turtle began to grow. Every few weeks, the turtle's size would visibly increase. She even showed her neighbors— proud of the incredible miracle of nature she had been gifted with. Except the turtle hadn't been growing at all. No, Pierce had been sneaking into her apartment and swapping out her beloved pet with turtles that were just a little bit larger than the last. Eventually, he gave it a rest, though, leaving the concierge with a massive turtle and no explanation as to why it had grown to be so large. Until, that is, he started replacing it again, with smaller and smaller ones. And that, my friends, is more than a little curious. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. 
I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.